Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Today we're going to be building a palace collectively. We're going to be putting together rooms like the sleeping room. Or we're hungry so the food room. And hey, we want to be entertained in the music room. Now even though we're doing this collectively, this is not a cooperative game. It is a competitive game. Today we're looking at the 2-4 to four player game, The Palace of Mad King Ludwig. Now this is a standalone game from Bezier Games. This is not an expansion to Castles of Mad King Ludwig. This is a game on its own. Today we're doing a rule school, which means I'm going to show you how to set up and play the game rule for rule so that you don't have to read the rule books. But first, let's start with a quick one minute overview and then we'll get started. The Palace of Mad King Ludwig is a two to four player game where you'll be collectively building the huge palace of Mad King Ludwig. But it's not a cooperative game, it's a competitive one where you're trying to be the best builder. You'll be building different types of rooms, like living rooms and sleeping rooms, hallways, stairs, and even downstairs rooms. Each room type has different rewards that you'll get when completing them. You'll be tracking rooms you built on your own blueprints board, trying to get end game points. You'll be adding room tiles to your board for extra points or other abilities. You'll also be adding secret end game goals that you're trying to fulfill. There's also plenty of public end game goals that you're fighting for. But you better complete those rooms in a timely manner because once both ends of the moat connect to each other, the game ends. To set up, you'll first put together the garden board. It comes in three parts. You put it together like a puzzle. And on the right side, you'll see there is the lake. You want that side to point towards the outside of the table because the main playing area is going to be the left of what you're looking at now. Now you'll place the board in a specific spot depending on the amount of players you have. In this case, we're playing a three player game. So I have this just offset the center. This is the center of my table and it's just offset because the two players sitting on this side of the board will now both have access to the tiles that are going to be available throughout the game and be able to build the palace, which happens out here. And so here are some diagrams for the best place to place it depending on the amount of players. And again, this is going to give you the best experience so that all players can see and reach the tiles on the board and in the palace. Next, you'll find all of the moat tiles that look like this, and you'll put them in small stacks on the edge of the board in the lake. And you'll want to use both edges of the lake to do this. Then you'll find all the secret swan tokens and place them on the bridge. These secret swans are black background with a gray swan with a white outline on one side and they have a secret color on the back side. You want to make sure that they're all shuffled up with the gray side showing. Next you'll take all of the normal swans which are full colors and you'll place them all in the lake. I've reoriented the board so it's a little easier to see what I'm about to show. You're going to find all the tiles that have this heart on them. Those are favorite tiles. You're going to shuffle them all face down and place them on the board where you see the heart icon just like this. You'll then take the top four of those and place them face up in these four spots. Those are going to be goals for the end of the game that you're shooting for. Then you'll take all of the stair tiles and place them where it shows stairs. And it'll look something like that. Now just to the left of these stairs, you're going to be placing the hallway tiles. You'll shuffle them all up, make a single stack, and place them right there. You'll then take the top three hallway tiles and place them right at the edge of that bridge. Next, we'll be putting room tiles face down five equal size stacks right there. So it would look something like this. Next, you'll take the top six room tiles from the leftmost stack and place them face up on these six spots. And so it will look something like this. Each player will select their blueprint board and take the corresponding tokens for that board. For example, this is the red board, which uses red crowns, as you can see on the board itself, as their tokens. They'll place them all white side face up. And regardless of which board you take, you take the corresponding tokens that are shown on that board. Then each player should get three favorite tiles. They will secretly look at them and then decide if they'd like to keep one of them. If they do, they will place it horizontally in one of the slots on the side of their board. If they don't want to keep any of them, they could take them all and put them at the bottom of the favorite pile face down like this. In this case, since we kept one, the two that we didn't keep goes to the bottom of the favorite pile that I showed you in setup. 
Now, if this is your first time playing, you probably won't know which tile that you may want. And if you do want a tile, you wouldn't even know really where to place it yet. So I would recommend you can take these three tiles, keep them face down near you. And then once you've watched this full rule school, you'll have an idea of which one that you might want to keep and where to place it. You should make sure you do this before you start the game. You'll then select a start player at random. The object of the game is to have the most points once the palace has been completed, and you can score in a multitude of ways, like some of these favorite tiles, which are end game public goals, like having built personally the most music rooms in the palace. Some of the room types will get you points if you're able to complete them, and some of them are going to give you points based upon other types of things you've done throughout the game. If you're able to build a certain amount of rooms of different types, you'll be gaining points at the end of the game. And if you build at least one, two, or three of all the rooms, you'll be gaining points. And you'll also be gaining points for getting sets of the different swan colors at the end of the game. Over the course of the game, players will be taking turns in clockwise order. On their turns, they'll either be adding one of the rooms to the palace, or a hallway, or maybe some stairs or they'll be adding secret endgame goals from the favorite tiles to their blueprints board, or a room tile for a special ability that will activate. Now let's talk about the four possible things you can do on your turn. You're only gonna do one of these. The first option is to place a room tile in the palace. Here you can see many different face-up room tiles that you could possibly place. The ones towards the left you'll see have these icons of swans below them. This means in order to place one of these rooms, you'd need to spend swans as currency in order to place those rooms. These two would need two, either of these two would need one. Anytime you see a gray background with a white swan, it's a swan of any color. These two in the front have no swan icons, which means they can be placed for free. Now, since the beginning of the game, everything starts as an upstairs room. All the rooms that have a white edge border are upstairs rooms. This one has dark border. That means it's a downstairs room, which means it can only be placed after someone has built some stairs going downstairs. Since this is the beginning of the game, there are no stairs. So we're going to go ahead and build this room, the baconry. When you place a room, you must line it up with the grid of the palace, and at least one of your entrances must match up with another entrance in the palace. So I could place it just like this, for example. And when you place a tile, you're going to take one of your tokens and place it white side up on that room. Next, you'd update your blueprint board. Now, this was the tile I had just placed. The tile on the upper right will tell me what type of room this is. It matches this icon. This is a food room. Also note that this color matches the color of the tile as well. If I have not yet placed a room of that type, I would take one of my uh, tokens and place it white face up right there. If I had already placed a room, let's say I placed another one of these food rooms later, instead of placing a token, I would move it to the right like this. This is tracking how many rooms you've actually placed of that type inside the palace. Next, you would possibly collect swans. Now, anytime you match up an entrance to a like colored entrance, you can get a swan. So in this case, I place this room, this yellow matches here, I would get one yellow swan. However, I told you earlier that the gray ones are wild. So I could have placed it anywhere like this and gotten the color swan that I had matched. Here I would have gotten a red swan, here a purple, here a blue. But in this case, let's just leave it here as if I had gotten a yellow. Now about the swans, if another person had placed this hallway and they had their token here, when I put this here, we both would have gotten them. Anybody that matches a swan adjacent to the tile that I have just placed and any of these entrances will also get one. So in this case, I would have gotten a yellow swan, but so would this player. However, if I had been the one to actually add both of these, I would not have gotten two yellows because you can only get one swan per entrance per tile that you've placed. But let's go back and make it what it really was, which was just me placing the first tile of the game. In this case, we would now slide all of the rooms down and fill it up with the leftmost tile stack. It would then be the next player's turn. So let's say the next player has placed this. Now, like I talked about before, this player would then update their blueprint board and both of these players would get purple swans as talked about previously. But this now completes this room. A completed room happens when all of its entrances are connected to other entrances of other tiles. When a tile gets completed, three things happen. Number one, the token on that tile gets flipped over to the darker side. This will help with scoring towards the end of the game and always let you know which rooms are completed. 
Number two, that player will also get a reward that's in the upper left hand part of that tile. All tiles have these and we'll go over what these rewards are later in the video in more detail. And lastly, the player who placed the tile that caused the completion will look to see if there are any moats showing because as tiles are used, these stacks are going to become empty. Right now there's nothing empty and so no moats are placed. And so as the game goes on, you might see a moat marker here. And as more and more tiles get emptied, you'll see more and more moat icons. So in this case, the player who caused the completion to happen would get to place one moat tile. Now when adding a moat tile, you can add it to either the left side or the right side of that bridge there. And you'll start really close to the moat and you'll start working your way around. This is acting as a timer for the game because once the moat completely goes around all of the buildings in the palace, the game will end. So you can place it on this side or this side as of right now, then you'll be building off of those. If the palace extends to the edge of the garden before any moat tiles have been placed on that side, you'll need to start it on the edge like that and start coming around like this. Also, if there's an area that is completely closed off with walls, even if it's in the middle of the palace, you could choose to place a moat tile here instead of on one of the edges. However, you're not forced to, and this does not need to be filled in order to end the game. Also, if the moat is going around the palace, if there are inlets like this, they must be filled in with the moat before moving on this way. And when placing a tile, note that none of the tiles that are already placed, nor the garden board can be moved at any time to make room. So you always have to make sure that there's at least room for one moat tile to go across the tile edges between that and the table. And there always has to be at least one entrance from an upstairs room pointing out so that can be added on too. Now back to placing and completing rooms. When a room is placed into the palace, you can block it off since this is a legal play. Since at least one entrance matches up to an entrance, you could block this off so a competitor can never close this room and get the reward. So it can be quite confrontational at times when you do this. Now sometimes you might be able to complete more than one at a time as we just saw here. If that happens, the player who's taking the turn gets to resolve theirs first and then in turn order. If the same player actually owned more than one of those, they get to decide which order of those tiles they get to resolve first. And remember, it's the player who placed the tile who's placing the moats. And here it's going to be one, two, three, four for each of the completed tiles. If they just completed three tiles at once, it's going to be four times three. That player is going to place 12 moat tiles. Now that we've talked about many things that can happen when you place a room in a palace, let's talk about the other possible things you can do on your turn. The second option is to place a hallway or set of stairs. If you place a hallway, you must take the one that's on the top of this stack and place it using normal placement rules. If you decide to take the stairs, when placing the stairs, you must make sure that the light side of the stairs is matching with a upstairs room that has a white background. And when placing a darker downstairs room, it has to either be attached to another downstairs room or to a black side of the stairs. And of course, this would have closed the stairs. And let's say this player placed that. And downstairs rooms can continue to be connected to each other like so. Two light sides of the stairs can be placed next to each other. Two dark sides of the stairs cannot be placed back to back. This is to stop someone from hindering a downstairs room being put right next to a downstairs. If for some reason you cannot legally place any of the room tiles, nor a hallway, nor the stairs, all of these rooms would go to the discard pile and you would then fill it up with the next rooms in the stack. And the discard pile is just to the left of the favorite tiles. Now, other than placing a room in the palace or placing a hallway or stairs, the third option you could do is to place a favorite tile in your palace. And you do so by paying three swans of any colors and taking the top three from the stack of the favorite tiles, choosing one and placing it face down just like this on your board in a horizontal fashion. Now, remember, these are secret goals that you're trying to get at the end of the game. The ones that you didn't take go to the bottom of the favor pile and you don't have to take one. You could put all three back. And you cannot take this action if all six slots of your blueprints board are taken up in any way. And the last possible option is to place a room tile on your blueprints board. You would pay three swans of any type to do this. And when doing so, you can take any one of these to place there. 
Just like when uh, placing a tile in a room, these two would be free to take in place there. These ones, you still have to spend the swans in order to do this, but let's take this free one. Now, unlike the favorite tiles that go flat up against the board, the room tiles, you can choose any empty slot and put a diagonal so that the grass matches the grass and you'll get an ability. Now that you know most everything that goes on in the game, we can talk about these abilities now. These all on the right are end game abilities. This would give you 10 points at the end of the game. If you put it here, you would at the end of the game, if you fulfill this, but you're tied with somebody else, then you actually still get it, even if you're tied where normally you would not. If you had placed it here, of course you cannot place it here because there's already a tile there, but if this was not here and you place it here, you would get three swans of any type at the end of the game. This one allows you to move two different moat tiles to the other side of the moat, and you would usually do this to unblock a tile that you're trying to complete. These two are the same. It is paying one or two if you have both of them, less swans than normal. So if you have both of these, all of the room tiles essentially are going to be free for you. And just like the favorite tiles, if all of these are full, you cannot take the action of placing a room tile on your board. Now that you know a little bit about the Blueprints board, let's talk about these different tracks. Now, anytime you get your token to the third spot on any of your tracks, you'll take a swan immediately of that color. If you ever get to the end, at the end of the game, you'll get 10 points for that. Once this token is at the end of the track, if you place another tile of that type, you take another token and place it here, and then continue to move it right as you add tiles of that type, just like normal. Players continue taking turns in clockwise order until the end of the game is triggered by one of three ways. Now here we have the moat coming from both sides uh, of the bridge, and it will end if the moat does come in contact with the other moat, either diagonally or orthogonally. Now the player placing this moat, if this was the only one they were placing, they could have placed it right here, which would have lengthened the game, but they could have placed it here, which would have ended the game because both ends of the moat are meeting. It also will end if there's no moat tiles left or if the last stack of room tiles has been depleted. At that point, anybody that has activated the lower right ability on their blueprint board would get any three swans of their choice. So let's talk about the different rewards you can get for completing one of the eight types of rooms. For the utility room, you get three points for something. In this case, it's how many food rooms you own or how many red swans you have. For the sleeping rooms, you'll essentially get to add a room tile to your blueprint board, just as in that action described earlier in this video. For the music rooms, you'll get seven points straight up at the end of the game. For the food rooms, you get to take three of the favorite tiles and add one if you want to to your uh, blueprint board, just like as if you took that action as shown previous in this video. The downstairs rooms allow you to take a secret swan. The uh, living rooms allow you to take one swan of each of the four types that's on this tile. So in this case, two blue, two purple. The, down the stairs allow you to take three points for every connected downstairs room to it. For example, this player will get six points for having two downstairs rooms connected to their stairs. The hallways give you a certain amount of swans depicted on that specific tile. For end game scoring, you'd use this score pad that's going to walk you through. The first thing is points. You see that building icon. You'd get, again, 10 points for the rooms that you've built at least uh, five of. You'd get 10 points if you had activated that ability. You'd also get points if all of your rooms, you'd built at least one of them, you'd get 10 points. If you built at least two of all the rooms, you'd get 20 plus 10 for a total of 30. And if you built at least three of every one of the rooms, you'd get 30 plus 20 plus 10 for a total of 60 points. You'd place those there. Then we'd score the end game completion rewards for all the rooms that are completed. For example, for the stairs, you'd get three points for each connected downstairs room to the stairs. For the utility room, you'd get three points per blank, depending on what is on that specific tile. And for the music room, you'd get seven points straight up. Then you'd get points depending on sets of swans. So here, one set is one. If you have two unique colors, it's two points. Three unique colors, four points, all the way up to if you have one set of all five different colors, it's 10 points. And so you see how many different sets you have and you add up all of the points from that. And then you add up the points for any of the favor goals that you have. For example, do you have the least amount of green swans? If you do and you're the only one, you'd get 15. If you had one of your favorite tiles here, and you tied for somebody with the least amount of green, well, you'd still get the 15 points. And you'd be doing that for the four public goals that were placed at the beginning of the game and everyone's private goals. For the private goals, 
Only you are able to fulfill them or not. Nobody else can score points from your private goals. Whoever has the most points at the end is the winner. If two or more players are tied from those players, the one with the most total swans wins. That includes secret and regular swans. However, if there's still a tie, King Ludwig loses his patience after all that counting and the inability of the tied players to have one of them be superior, so all tied players lose and the player with the next highest score wins. Well, I hope this helped you dive right into the Palace of Mad King Ludwig and get to the fun faster than you normally would have if you needed to read the rule book yourself. If you have additional questions, I've placed a link in the description below me in the video. This will be the best place to ask your additional questions because not only will I see it, but the publisher Bezier Games will be able to see it as well.